Okay, good morning. Thank you for coming. Please receive to Engineer Domain Cosa. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to Europe, Python. I'm really excited to be here um, for yet another year. Um, just, just before I start my talk, I'd like to, to say a little bit about myself so you, you, you'll better understand the context of it. Um, I've been interested in this software distribution since basically I was a student. Um, I was, I was um, using Gen2 back at times, um, um, developing for Google Summer of Code uh, a project to, to package Python automatically uh, for the Gen2 platform and so on. And in the last three years, I've been working on um, NixOS. Uh, it's a Linux distribution, probably heard of it. Um, and and I'm, I'm tackling the problem of, of how to distribute all those packages to people and make it easy to use. And it turns out it's, it's not. So, so I'll, I'll talk about uh, how Haskell does it and how that compares to Python and, and what we can learn and what things we already know but we just can't get there because it's, it's, it's complicated because of our legacy. Um, so, and currently I'm working for a, a company called um, Snap, and we're, we're doing open source networking uh, soft, uh, software, and I'm an um, infrastructure engineer, so I'm, I'm setting up the whole, the whole pipeline for testing and ben benchmarking them. So, so, so my pi, right? We we got types in Python, so clearly that we are improving Python, even though it's more than 25 years old. Um, and and Haskell is definitely inspiration here. Um, so so there clearly there are things to improve uh, and to learn upon. Um, so so let's let's start how Haskell does packaging, um, and and their 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 tool is called Cabal, and you would have a file like this. It's a special kind of syntax. And at the top you'll see just some metadata about the package. And at the bottom you'll see, you can say, okay, my, my thing, my software is a library, but there is also an executable. Uh, and it has these uh, dependencies. Uh, it lies in the source uh, directory and so on. Um, so, so one thing that you'll figure out that this, compared to Python, this is just a file that you can parse. And in Python, we have this script you have to run for actually to do something. And I'll, I'll dive into that a bit later, why, why that's a big difference, um, and how that you know, affects everyone pretty much. Um, so if you think about the API, in, in this case, in Haskell, you would parse this and get the metadata back. Uh, in, in Python, the API is setup function which does everything like literally everything. Um, so so um, the, the format is, is more approachable uh, and we'll see that a bit later. So, so one thing, if you were careful enough, you, you notice this builds type uh, line in, in that file. And, and if it's, if it's the, um, specified as simple, that means you parse that file and you have all the information you need to, to, to install that package in Haskell. Um, but also, um, that you can say build type make or build type custom. And in, in case of make, it will run the make files and it will skip the, the Haskell building process. And in case of custom, it will run a, a Haskell program with specific hooks. Um, where you can specify code. Um, so you have the power to go from very simple to, to overriding. Unfortunately, the custom is not that used, uh, the custom method is not used uh, because it's fairly poorly documented, but that, that's also a good thing because then people fall back to simple. Um, so, so in Python, we have PEP uh, 518, uh, which is, I think it's, it's not accepted yet, but uh, it talks about basically how to hijack setup tools build process and, and you can define your build process. Um, um, and this is in progress and you'll be able to, you'll be able to, um, to go and not even touch the setup tools machinery and, and do whatever you'll want. You'll have the freedom to, to for example, write a, a make file backend for, for Python packaging. 
Uh, and, and of course, this will be integrated into the PIP and so on and all the tools, um, which is which is really nice because finally we'll we'll be able to to go forward from 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 the the legacy that we've been stuck. Um, so just a little bit about uh, advanced um, um, features in the Cabal. For example, here you, in, in Haskell you can say, okay, I want to have this flag that you can toggle. And for example, if we have a flag debug, you can, we can describe it, provide a default. And then throughout the file, we can write conditionals, like you know, if this flag is enabled, then do this. Uh, then this option is, is configured and so on. So it's like a, a very simple language within, with just if sentences and, and nothing more. Um, and and this, way, this gives you the flexibility of, of, of saying, um, for example, if you have a library, do we want HTTPS support or not? Um, and, and, but there are downsides also in Haskell. For example, at runtime, once the package is compiled, there is no way to know which flags were used. So you just don't know that. Um, and, and also, for example, you can say if HTTPS flag is enabled, then add these dependencies. But it also works the other way around. If for some reason those dependencies are in the environment, that flag will be enabled by default. So there, there is some magic, and, and they, also, they also have problem. And one thing you learn in packaging is that features are really problematic. Once you start introducing them, you have to support them. And, and these kind of things are really, really painful on the long run. Um, and, and in Python, we have the, uh, the PEP 508, which, which is uh, environment markers. So for example, if I have a dependency, you can say, Okay, this dependency is on, all, only on Python 3 and Windows, for example, and so on. Uh, this is already uh, uh, supported in PIP, but um, not many people are using this because they know, don't know about it. Um, and the idea is that you don't write uh, in Python if, if uh, imperative code saying, you know, if we're on Windows, blah, blah, blah. You just say, okay, this dependency and the marker is Windows, and you're done. And this gives everyone else the possibility to, to also get this information, to parse this marker, and, and to, to, to do something with that information. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk about later what, what we're doing with that. Um, so so Hackett is, is the, the, the Haskell Py, Python packaging index. You, you publish your packages there, and people can download them. Um, but just... just um, as an example of a feature where, where you know, it's really painful to, to support on the long run, in Hackett you can edit the Cabal files in place through the website. So that means if you release version 0.1, for example, um, somebody can go and, and edit that Cabal file and remove a dependency. And then it's not really 0.1 anymore, it's, it's a whole new thing. Um, it's slightly modified, but it's still not the same thing. Um, so, so in that case, the, the hackage will, will add this uh, revision to um, a line to Cabal file. And you know, when you start to think about, OK, now I have this local uh, process where I release software, and then I can also edit it online. But then what happens if I bump this revision and push it to the hackage and so on? So there is a lot of stateful things going on suddenly. Um, and while you know, this might be a, a good idea, and maybe some you know, like 1% of people want it. For everyone else using the hackage to download packages and to figure out the state, this is really, really uh, problematic. Especially if you want to have reproducible builds, once you edit that file, the hash, the hash changes of your tarball. So all the people that say, okay, download this file, and this is the hash, they will suddenly get a mismatch. And we really don't want to enforce a culture where well, you just say, okay, it's a new hash, whatever, because then there is really no point, right? Um, so these kind of features um, are also present in, in Haskell, and they're also present in Python, which uh, they give us headaches every day. Um, and, and the API then f for, for um, in the hackages that you can say revision and, and two dot uh, cabal, and you can get these revisions. But it's a, a, a 
you basically have two versions. First, first you have a version and then a revision, and it just uh, becomes a nightmare handling those. Um, so, you know, uh, Haskell is, is one year older than, than Python, and, and they've also had this path of, of improving the packaging ecosystem. And since about, uh, un until two years ago, they had this problem where, um, well, in your Cabal file, you had to specify the dependencies. And we all know that, you know, not all s software packages work well together. And in case of Haskell, because there are types, you would get a new package, the types would change, and suddenly your, your usage of that package would, would not, you know, would, wouldn't work, so Haskell wouldn't compile. And, and this is the, the, most, the biggest problem they had, is, is called Cabal Hell. So then you would start, you know, when, when a package would get a new version, uh, things wouldn't compile, you would start, you know, putting in these constraints and so on. So every developer would do this for, for himself or herself, and, and it's just a big waste of time um, trying to figure out which packages really compile. So I'll, I'll talk about how Haskell solved this, but just as a, um, an interesting thought how Elm, which is another um, functional language, solved it. Um, they basically said, in, in your dependencies, you have to say, always specify the limits of the major version. So if you say, I depend on package HTTP, it has to be between version five and six. And then if you uploaded um, that package and API changed, it wouldn't allow you to upload it uh, unless you bump the major version. So it's, it's basically forcing the semantic version at the package. So the package manager forces you not to change the types, the, the signature, unless you bump the major version. Um, and, and that's really nice. We, we cannot do that in Python, unfortunately, because there is no way to really detect if an API changed. Well, of course, that we could parse the, the APIs and so on, but that's, that's the gray area. Um, there, not, some, not something, uh, hopefully something we will be able to do one day. Um, so, so, okay, so, so just um, how Haskell solved that? Um, so they solved it, actually it was released in 2005, so just one year ago, um, called Stackage. So Stackage is a, a stable source of Haskell packages with guarantee packages built consistently in past tests before generating nightly and long-term support. So what does that mean? So so um, they built a site where you, as a maintainer, can log in, you, you specify some of your information, and you say, okay, I'm a maintainer of these packages on Hackage. And, and then they go and they, and they pick a dependency tree uh, of, of your package and build it and see if all the tests and everything passes. And then they say, okay, we use these versions, and these versions compiled. Um, and then they provide an API for that. Um, so you can not, you can get those versions. So so if you think about it, in in Python we have requirements.txt, but everyone has their own set of versions. In Haskell they they pretty much crowdsource that. So they have an, a website where all the, the those versions are, are are tested and compiled, and and people use that uh, as a community effort, not as something you commit to your repository and and you hope for the best. Um, and, and, and so, so if, you want, if you want, for example, to have backwards compatibility, you depend on stackage LTS 6, uh, and then all the minor versions, uh, 6.7, 6.8, guarantee you that the API didn't change, but they still ship security updates and so on. Uh, and when you're ready, usually the new version means a new a GHC, which is their compiler, uh, the main compiler, and then you're ready to go and, and fix those errors, compiler errors, and you go to the next version. Um, so I think that's very interesting um, because you, you're, they, are, they are doing all the work together uh, at, in one place instead of uh, everyone in their own garden. Um, and um, not sure really if, if we could do something like this in Python because it's m way more complicated than just compiling the package and saying it works. Um, but I still think it would be worth the effort of at least having the major software um, that we use in Python um, to, to have these versions uh, community managed uh, instead of, um, well, 
uh, having this work done by each individual or, or company. So yeah, our, our solution is requirements.txt. So together with, with StackEdge, they also released a, a, a tool called Stack, which is like a wrapper around Cabal. So it, it, it can do more things than, than just Cabal. Um, and you specify a, a, a configuration file like this, and you say, okay, uh, I'm gonna use these flags um, that you'll pass to Cabal when I'll be compiling software. I'm gonna use these packages. So, so you say, okay, uh, the, the package is in a current directory and there's the Cabal file and that's the one we'll use to, to build this project. And you can have multiple of those. So if you think about how Python does that, you have to say pip install minus e dot or something like that. So that's imperative. You have to actually like run that and when you have a new, if you develop on two packages, you have to run for both of them. And in this case, it's declarative. You open that file, sorry. You open that file and you know what packages are being added. Um, it's, there is no imperative steps instead of then saying just stack build and th that will execute the whole thing. Uh, so it's, it's way more declarative. And, and, and at the bottom you see the resolver. This is where you get this big set of uh, pinned version uh, and you say LTS 6.7 and there you go. Um, you have most of the hackage packages pinned down and you're sure that those work. Uh, and there's also a field called extra dependencies and those, those are the dependencies that are not in the LTS. So not everything is pinned down. Uh, it's a community effort. So of course, if people don't do it, then it's not there. So for all the, the, the packages you have that you don't, uh, that are not part of the LTS, you can specify them uh, there. And Stack will complain if you don't um, do that. Um, so it has a bunch of uh, simple commands, uh, like uh, stack setup is something like virtual environment for us. Uh, it will download a compiler and um, it will set it up for you uh, based on, on, of the, on the resolver that you're using and so on. And stack init will generate the files. It's like a mini templating for starting Haskell packages and so on. Uh, so, so that's... Um, that's what Stack does, and, and the community was really, really happy uh, when, when this happened. A lot of problems went away. Um, right. So, so, now, so now that we have uh, this package with all of packages, and a stackage as a set of files, uh, a set of versions, um, then, then you know, my, my, my job and what I'm, I'm doing is, okay, how do we distribute all this software to the users so that they can really um, um, get this seamlessly and, and it wor works for, for the, you know, whatever the platform. And, and um, um, we're doing uh, uh, this with Nix. It's a functional language. Um, it's based on, a, based on a PhD thesis by Elko Dostra and it's, uh, um, it's, it's a very short and nice thesis. I recommend it to read to anyone who, is, who cares about packaging uh, and how, how the functional language concept can change the, the thinking uh, dramatically and you know, improves a lot of things that we have problem with today. Um, so, so this is, for, for, for Haskell, this is kind of the stack that we have. Um, and Nix packages is then a collection of Nix expressions that specify how uh, some software should be built, uh, similar to apt or, or something else in the distributions, um, except that um, we're not tied to a Linux distribution and we support Darwin and, and um, Linux. Um, so, so why you would uh, need this layer uh, on top of the upstream package or PyPI is because we, we take care of system dependencies um, uh, we have a, a build system that will compile these packages and provide binaries for you. And, and we have a, a really powerful API, which you'll see later, uh, so that you can actually go there and change those packages and, and, and you know, tweak them in a way that you want, apply some patches, uh, bump versions, or whatever you want to do. Um, so you're not, um, so we're not the upstream that you just have to say, okay, either you use uh, what we have or it's nothing. Um, but you have the power of, of changing that. 
And, and most importantly, in, in, in Nix packages, we have all the Haskell packages there. Uh, we don't compile all of them. Uh, we, we don't, um, because the, the, there is, that's a lot of you know, power and, and disk space that you need. So we take only one GHC version, and for that uh, compiler, which is the latest stable one, we compile all the packages, or most of them. Um, but theoretically, we could, we could distribute all the binaries and so on. Uh, so the user can then say, okay, I, I, I have this project, I have these packages, I, I want binaries, and it will, you know, uh, the, the Nix package manager will download that, and, and there you go, you, have, you, ha you didn't compile anything except your package. And, and that's really nice, um, especially because you can share it between Darwin and Linux. Um, okay, so how does, how does that work in Haskell? How do we... How do we get that done, and, and why, why is it so hard for Python to, 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 to accomplish this? Um, so this is the, the simple infrastructure um, that we have. So let me explain what's really going on here. Uh, so on, in the left upper corner, you see Hackage. That's the API that has all the packages. And then there is a, a script that goes and downloads all of them, uh, calculates the, the SHAs and everything, and commits that in a repository. So you have a git repository that's called all cabal hashes, and you have all cabal files there. So you can go through all of them and parse them and generate uh, dependency trees and so on, whatever you want to do. Um, and, then you, and then those hashes, uh, those cabal files are taken and they're built into stackage nicely, and that, that um, gives you a view of what builds currently and not, and that's a continuous process, of course. Uh, and then, based on the stack edge nightly, when things kind of look okay, they make this LTS Haskell, uh, which you've seen before, and that's kind of like, okay, this kind of compiles all together now, let's, let's take those versions. So this is like the stack edge and the upstream that Haskell provides. So then we have hackedge.nix that parses uh, the all cabal hashes repository and the stack edge repository and generates Haskell packages.nix and it generates configuration lts.nix. So in Haskell packages.nix, there is every version of every package specified how you should build it. Uh, and this is all generated from the Cabal files. Uh, it's one-to-one -one mapping. Uh, some features in Cabal we don't support. Uh, some features we do. There is room for improvement, but in general, it's, it works. Um, and the configuration lts basically just says, Okay, based on the LTS version and, uh, and the long list of version dependencies, pick those versions to be the default ones when you, when you use uh, these Haskell packages. Uh, so there, it's just basically pinning in Nix, okay, take these versions. Because in ha hackage packages, it will always use the latest version, which is, as I've said before, not always means that things will work. All right. So then there are two more files, configuration-common and configuration GACXY. So those are the, the, the files that have to be manually um, that have to be manually crafted and, and maintained. And in there, if, if the cabal file, for example, doesn't have specified system dependencies, in there we will override and say, okay, for package HTTP you know, also uh, take this system dependency and so on. So basically everything that's not in upstream cabal file we will override there. And in, in configuration GHC we will do that but by on, based on the GHC version. So some GHC versions might need different flags or, or disable tests because they don't work and so on. So those are the two files that we maintain and everything else is upstream provided by the Haskell community. And then you have this cabal.nix in the middle, and this is what the user gets. So when you have your project, you have your cabal file, you say cabal.nix, you run it, and it will generate a nix expression automatically out of it, specifying all the dependencies. And in, in there you can say, I want a specific LTS version, or I want the latest packages, or whatever. So this is, this is all, as a user, you just run cabal.nix file, and you get basically the whole set of of dependencies that you know that are going to work. And, and the, the cabal call nix file has this function called package overrides where you can basically override anything from the upstream. You can say, take this package, but different version. Take this package, but apply this patch, or whatever you want. And then you, in, in, then you install this um, um, software, and there you go, you have binary distributed. 
um, Haskell pipeline. Um, all right. I hope, I hope that's, that, that was not too fast and it's clear enough. All right. So, so this is the, probably the, the hardest slide, uh, but I would really like to say a few words about the infrastructure in X and how these files all work together. And it all fits on one slide. Uh, it's just not that easy to explain. So, so, let's, so basically what we want to do is some kind of inheritance. We have different files and we want those files to override each other, right? Uh, we want this powerful overriding uh, mechanism. So at the top you see a function called fix, and that's a fix point. That's how you do recursion in, in, in functional language. Um, and, and it's basically calling itself. It's a recursive function that just calls itself. And how it works is it takes the output and it feeds it into the input. And because the language is lazy, it will do that only until you reference something. So as for example, uh, um, at, in the middle I defined something you would call a dictionary. It's called an attribute set in X, but it's pretty much the same. And you can say, okay, I have an attribute foo, foo that is uh, the value foo and bar with bar. But the foo bar is actually self.foo and self.bar. But that self, oh, pardon That self is really just the, the input of this function. It's a lambda function, it gets self as a parameter. But that self is actually the output of itself. So it will actually then uh, reference self that foo and self will be the same actual thing and it will reference the foo and get it back. So it's, it's just recursion and a function, nothing really fancy. And when you, when you call fix, uh, fix point on this, um, uh, on this function, on, on this uh, dictionary, and you ask is the foobar, you will get the value foobar back. And it will just basically call it twice. Um, and this is a way how we, how we um, do dependency and how, we, how you can reference different things. Okay, so, so now, now that we have that, um, we want to have a little bit more of flexibility and we define uh, a function called extend I won't go into how it works, uh, uh, how it's defined, but um, if you look at the override, that's the function, that's the API you get. And, and this override function accepts two things, self and super, and self is the input, and super is the output of, of this dictionary. So you have the power to, to, to get the previous configuration file and either references inputs or outputs. So you have both things. Uh, so in this case, I say, okay, uh, take the foo, take the output, a super dot foo, and reverse that. So if I call then fix extend d and the override, so that means extend the the d dictionary and override it with this function, uh, you will see that foo bar value is um, different because we have reversed the foo, and that gives us the power to override the dictionary at the top either by inputs or outputs. Um, and you, if you if you call it twice, um, well, it's not seen here, but you will get you will get foobar back. Um, so so this gives you this gives all the, the power to override these files. So okay, um, how do we use that? Um, this is then all that you need to combine all these files. Uh, you say first I have a fixed point which takes care of the recursion. And then I can take all the Haskell packages, the common configuration file you've seen before, the compiler-specific config, the packet set config, and then at the bottom, all of the overrides where you can hook into. And, and you can change everything from the upstream, how it's built. Um, so in Python, currently in X, we manually edit files. Why? Because of this problem, we have a set up high script, and you have to run all of those scripts to actually get and figure out what's going on. So someone would need to take that and for everything in Python packaging index, generate some JSON file or something with all this meta information that we could then use to generate and automate all of this. Um, and we would need to maintain the requirements file global for the full Python packaging index. So these are the two big, big projects um, 
that one would need to tackle in order to have the same infrastructure. And, and then we would uh, be able to build all the, the whole Python package in index, basically, and distribute it to, to people. And, um, well, the first one, um, pro the first problem is kind of being solved. Um, and, and community is, is trying to get there, but we still don't have a way to do it today. Um, but the infrastructure is improving. We got wheels. We're getting a new Python packaging index called Warehouse, uh, which is going to be tested and easily changeable and so on. So everything around is changing, but this is still not doable today. And with the build system hook that I talked before, we'll be able to have different tools than just setup tools to build Python packages. And hopefully one day we'll have a standard one that will be statically based instead of a script that you have to run. Uh, and as for the second problem, I don't know currently if anyone is solving that, uh, crowdsourcing the, the versions, but it's definitely something that uh, we'll have to solve it ourselves or someone will have to do it for us. So, so Python is actually doing quite good in, in the sense that it has all of these things are being worked on and so on. But one thing that's really missing is, if you think about it, that it's still not declarative enough. We have so many files that you have to touch. You have to touch the setup pi, setup.tg, requirements, manifest. Now the pi project normal is coming, talks.ini, and, and it's just a lot of different things you have to set. Uh, and, and in Haskell, there's just two files, the cabal and the stack. Um, and it's really hard to get rid of these because this is our legacy. Um, but it's a lot of information people have to know to actually to use it. Um, and, and this is improving, but it's still an ongoing process. All right, so, so this, this talk was based on the Peter Siemens inside the Nix packages Haskell infrastructure. Uh, if you want to see that talk, it, ha it goes in a little bit into the details, how it all works. Um, and and I, hope that, I hope that you've seen um, what are the current limitations? And, and at the same time, um, I, would, I would still like to thank uh, the Python packaging authority and everyone who's working on improving the ecosystem. It's, it's really hard to have 25 years of legacy and, and just replace all of this and say, okay, you know, we have this new shiny thing, it's gonna work out. Um, and and it's, it's going slow, but there's progress. Um, so, thank you. So we have time for questions, right? Thank you very much, Daman. Uh, someone wants uh, to ask a question now? No? Thank you. Any questions? Okay, thank you for coming.